Welcome to the XR Producer Beginner Course by Yahoo. I'm Henry Kaiser, and in this eighth episode, we're going to start to empower you to create your own 3D models using a technology called photogrammetry. In the previous videos in this series, we've really been focused on getting you to be able to tell an XR story using 3D models that were created by other people. In this video, for the first time, we're going to have you really empowered to create 3D models that are going to, go, going to go into your own pieces. So the first question, of course, is what is photogrammetry? Photogrammetry is the extraction of 3D data by comparing a lot of 2D images of a subject. More often than not, then that 3D data is being used to construct a 3D model. Now, the reason why this is really useful is it means that you yourself are actually able to contribute 3D assets to your projects without needing to take on a lot of advanced 3D artist skills and using the equipment you already probably have in your pocket. To create photogrammetry photos, you can use a regular smartphone or a DSLR or a video camera, and you don't need to have special apps loaded on it. This is going to be running with regular images taken on regular camera devices. But photogrammetry is not really just a magic wand that you can wave and any single thing that you see can suddenly have a perfect 3D model in your project. There will be five rules that we want to teach you that if you really take these to heart and are critical about what's going to work and what's not going to work, you'll get to really start to understand what can I potentially scan and what isn't going to likely scan very well. So right off the bat, the first rule is that the camera has to move after every photograph is taken. Now, a lot of people are familiar with taking panoramic photos at this point. The idea that you stay still and you just rotate your camera and the subject changes in the field of view and that stitches together a larger image. That's the opposite of what we're actually trying to do with photogrammetry. With photogrammetry, what you're going to be doing is while your subject stays still, every photograph you take of your subject should involve moving the camera to a new position. And the reason is, as we said, we're extracting data by comparing the photographs that you take. We're going to be triangulating, well, in this photograph of, of photograph one, the software might be looking at this knuckle, trying to understand the shape of this knuckle. And so it will compare where is the knuckle here compared to here, here, to here, here, to here, and so forth, getting to understand as it looks at distinct features and compares how does that feature change, rotate, get closer and further from shot to shot to understand what is the actual shape of this area it's focused on. And now while I talk about just one feature in the image, it will be doing this simultaneously for many, many features across all the images and as one area becomes out of perspective, it's of course now picking up new areas of features. It's trying to understand and compare as you work your way around an object. So again, between every photo you take, the camera should be physically changing its position from shot to shot. That said, the photos that you take in between as they go from position to position need to fairly closely overlap. And what I mean by that is, as you are taking a photo and you're moving to your next position, keep the change fairly gradual. You don't want to take a photo from here and then a photo from here and then a photo from here and assume the software is going to understand that those three things are related. More likely, you want to slowly take a photo and a photo and a photo and a photo where from each shot, the objects and the subjects in that shot, the various features it's tracking are only moving in small increments so that the software can really keep a clean eye on what it is focused on and it can begin to compare that without needing to like a lot of guesses. Even if you take a few hundred photos of a subject, if your photos are bouncing around the subject somewhat at random, the software is going to have to work harder and it may not produce as clean of a render as if you take a hundred sequential photos smoothly and slowly going around what you're trying to 3D scan. So keep a lot of overlap from shot to shot as you work your way around the thing that you are scanning. The next thing is really needing to understand the materials 
that the object is made of and how those affect light. Because really what the software is comparing are RGB values. They are the way that images store color in the files of the JPEG or the RAW or the TIFF that it is saving. It's not saving the actual depth distances in your JPEG. It's trying to interpret that by comparing those RGB values and the little features they are tracking from image to image. So if you have materials that fundamentally bend light and can change the RGB values from shot to shot, that means the software is going to get confused. It's going to watch an object get warbled by glass. It may see metal that is reflecting a glossy light off of the various light sources in the room. And so a black piece of metal suddenly becomes uh, illuminated. If you look at the, on the slide, you'll see this phone. Is the phone really white and black and green and red, such as all the icons that are being reflected off of the screen? No, of course not. The phone is supposed to be a black mirror object. But because of the properties of that black metal, that means that, or black metal and black glass, that means it can't actually understand and the software won't understand what uh, is happening with the shape. It will very likely thoroughly distort the shape of mirroring glass. Uh, similarly, what is the color of these glass bottles? Are they the color of the objects that are behind them on the other side? No, they're see-through. But the software doesn't understand that. It's just watching a lot of RGB values kind of be garbled, and it's not going to be able to produce a 3D model of things that are made of glass or metal or even a multi-material object that just happens to have these materials on different surfaces. Also, you really need to watch out for lights, as lights in space may uh, brighten or cast glare or sheen off of certain objects. Um, also, avoid things maybe like mesh. Uh, where that might be somewhat see-through from some angles and not see-through or let as much light through from others because that way as your camera moves around the software again may be confused by what is happening from shot to shot. Under rule four, the most important rule in my mind, which is keep your subject still. Now for a lot of people who teach photogrammetry tutor tutor tutorials around the internet, they're going to teach you to focus on scanning rocks, trees, sculptures, um, objects you can just place down on a surface. And those are the best things to start with as a beginner and because they are going to stay super fundamentally still. However, as you start thinking more flexibly about what you might try to 3D scan for your project, you may not be remembering that this object cannot move because again, it's not just comparing these RGB values but it's trying to interpret their point in space from photo to photo to photo. So if your object moves partway through your photo shoots, it's not going to intuitively understand the object was repositioned. It's going to think there's some property about this object, either a concavity or some other feature that is shape-based, and it's going to assume, oh, I should put a cavity in here to uh, reconstruct how this would work from photo to photo, assuming that my object actually hasn't moved. So if anything bends forward or bends back, moves left, moves right, if you move anything related to your subject that you're trying to scan in any way, you're going to see some fairly drastic uh, crunches or stretches, blobs or sharp edges appear that are not truly part of your scan. And that may be a little amusing as we talk about it in the abstract, but if you're 3D scanning some person and the person moves slightly through their shoot, you may now deform the actual way that the person uh, actually looks in real life. And that could be potentially traumatic for someone to see themselves in a way that is really uh, a distorted version of who they are. So to keep your object as still as possible, remember, don't touch it, don't move it, and look out for things that could cause it to move. So you're really looking out for wind uh, because wind, of course, is constantly moving things around. I suggest people don't try to scan trees or leafy, branchy plants. Um, I suggest people don't necessarily try to scan someone that has long hair on a windy day 
or people who have flowing clothes if there's more than a breeze going by. Also, you want to look just people in general. Any living subject is likely going to be constantly in motion as it breathes, as it just tries to, even if it's trying to stay still, there's so many bodily functions going on, little bits of movement will be occurring. And also their attention might get dragged. They might think about what their smile looks like. They might think to look somewhere for a second and their head moves as they slightly track something with their eyes. So you need to be really conscientious about what could move, what might make something move. And then if something is likely to move, you need to capture it as quickly as possible. So hopefully you've gotten in all of the photos or all of the video frames of what you're trying to capture it before it has had the chance to move from one position to another. Also, things in the environment that are moving could potentially impact the subject you're scanning. Now, if I am just scanning a sculpture and a few people walk by in the background, that's not a problem at all. If they walk by in between me and my sculpture, I may want to take some more photos without them there, but the software may ignore those people and I might not have a problem. However, if I have clouds that are going by and the clouds are casting dark shadows, or I'm you know, taking photographs on a sunny day and the sun is behind me, and at some point my own shadow might actually go across the subject, that change, that change in color, because it's now a lighter object becoming a darker colored object, could be enough to slightly confuse the software or to uh, put some hard edges into the faces of the 3D model that I'm trying to construct. So suddenly someone has a light portion of their face and a dark portion of their face only because my shadow may have gone across them. So you really need to keep an eye on things that are moving, whether that's the subject or it might just affect your subject in a key way. The last rule is really about shooting in orbitals. This kind of goes with our rule two about how each image should overlap and our rule one, how every image needs to be in a different position. But a great rule is to say, I'm not going to just shoot in kind of a zigzag pattern or in a squaring pattern. I want to shoot going all the way around my subject, facing back at my subject as I go around. And then I'll do maybe one wide shot that goes all the way around capturing the whole thing. I might do some low angle shots, a full orbit around facing upwards from the low, a full round of shots from the top facing down. Uh, and then only then might I start trying to get into just key detailed areas. But if you go all the way around a subject, taking an even number of photos all the way around, you can ensure the software has enough photographs to start with to begin rendering you know, the far away version, which might have a lower level of detail compared to as you start coming closer or you start getting underneath things. If you have objects that have overhangs, you want to not just go across the middle, but go underneath. If you have objects that have details on top, you want to go not just across the middle, but over the top as well. Um, and then unless you're working with a living subject, which is going to be constantly in motion, in which case generally you're going to want to do just the one wide shot around, unless you're working with a special rig that allows you to take many hundreds of photos at the exact same instant. Um, but that's not expected for a beginner, especially if you're watching this tutorial right now. So those are the key five rules. The way you might think about it is, does this, uh, can I get all the way around this object? Will I have lots of time with this object to take a lot of photographs? Uh, will I be able to uh, have control over this object so that it doesn't move and hopefully nothing is causing it to move? And also, what are the materials of this object? Is there anything about this object that is glass, metal, mesh, light emitting? And so if there aren't, you should be okay. Uh, Keep in mind, again, if you are going to be capturing people, one of the things that we often take for granted are these, your regular pair of reading glasses um, or just daily glasses. The distortion of glasses will be enough to cause deep cavitations around the eyes or other issues you might encounter with someone. So again, be really conscientious about what are all the materials. Don't just assume, oh, it's a person. People aren't made of glass. Are they wearing any glass? You need to take that into account. How many images do you need? That really depends often on the size of the object, the field of view of your camera, how, whether you're taking a lot of photos up close or, or, or fewer photos but from further away, um, what level of detail you need. Do you need to take the photos up close because you need a high level of detail? Or can you take photos further away and accept a lower level of detail? 
Uh, this will also, of course, go back to our optimization lesson from the previous episode, where if you're going to be down raising eventually, it may not be entirely necessary to have too much up close if eventually you're trying to get to a very small file size. On average, a regular object, uh, something that you can walk all the way around and take photographs of, you may only need 100 to 200 photos. Uh, an empty room without furniture in it, four walls, a ceiling and floor, you may be able to get away with you know, a few hundred photos, 150 to 200 starting, but the more furniture, the more details, the more cavitations, the more angles you have to work around, you're now looking at you know, 300 plus. When scanning a person, I generally recommend you take 300 frames of video. So in which case someone will be standing, they'll be more of a portrait shape, and you will shoot them in portrait video, walking around them in between 10 and 15 seconds. 10 to 15 seconds, hopefully, is a short enough period of time that your subject can stay perfectly still. And then extracting at 30 FPS from those 10 to 15 frames per second should give you those 300 to 450 images that you can then put into your software and then render out the 3D model of that person. Also, 10 to 15 seconds, if the person does move, gives you opportunity, hopefully, to get another minute, two minutes of the person and scan them three or four times. There are a lot of great photogrammetry tutorials out there on the web. Two that I absolutely swear by are the Guide to Photograph uh, Photography for Photogrammetry by Ben Kramer, which is also funded by Journalism 360. Um, you can find that on journalist.org. Or the Reality Capture tutorial by the company Capturing Reality, which has a long playlist on how to take the photos, as well as how to use their software, both for those photos or for more advanced forms of photogrammetry, which may involve lasers or even drones. Additionally, we've already mentioned photogrammetry of living subjects. Some additional details you should know, keep your subject isolated from any nearby objects. Um, this applies to all photogrammetry, but especially living subjects where it might be hard to kind of clip them away. Uh, get them to stand as still as possible, avoiding any unnatural poses that they might not be able to hold for 10 or 15 seconds. Arms crossed is easy because gravity is pulling you down. Arms at your sides or in your pockets is easy because gravity is pulling you down. But if their arms are up or they have any facial gestures that they can't naturally hold for very long, it is so likely that the muscles will start to droop due to gravity that you'll see a lot of distortion as they, the subject, has changed from your first image to the last image. You want to watch that person really specifically, make sure they're not moving. Um, very common for people to smile, change their chin, they start getting in their Instagram brain about what poses that they really want to be in, and so they'll keep moving a little bit from shot to shot, even as you're photographing them. So you're really just trying to see, okay, this is the one where they didn't move. Or they moved, hey, we're going to go again real quick, just take another scan of you, and you hit them a second time. You're going to work really quickly, we're going to use video. Your only speed limit with video really is motion blur. You don't want to go slow because you need to be done before they've had the chance to move a lot. Also, you don't want to do anything that causes them to move or react. If there's something you might bump into, they will follow you with their head to see if you bump into it. So make sure that they feel as confident about what you're doing as they are about the need for themselves to stay still. We've also put out an additional guide, Photogrammetry of People uh, from 2016. That's produced by myself and two partners uh, at the Night Lab. When it comes to photogrammetry softwares, again, there are a lot of choices out there. However, it's worth noting that most photogrammetry software will require a PC and generally an NVIDIA graphics card because it is capable of what are called CUDA calculations. I personally really recommend the Reality Capture software as it tends to be the fastest on the market, which produces really great quality models with its algorithm. And it has a new licensing structure called PPI, pay per image, which means you can put $0 up front for the software download, and then you only need to pay at the time of exporting your model if you're happy with how it looks based on the resolution of all the images that you put into it. This can usually get you a model for as cheap as a dollar, depending on how many photos you felt the need to put in and what were the resolutions that you were working with. So with that in mind, you can download Reality Capture from their websites, capturingreality.com slash download now. And on the website, they have a whole lot of photograph sample sets that you can use to download those samples and practice using that software, uploading the photos, aligning the images, and going ahead and calculating your models and exporting them. 
Additionally, if you're using PPI and you have already paid for the images in your project, you can have collaborators who download Reality Capture PPI as well, and they will not need to pay anything in order to work with the photos that you've already licensed for your project. Back to our Mars project though. What are some photogrammetry options we could have for working on our Mars project? Let's go to Laura and talk out what we might do on that front. Hey Laura, so uh, we're thinking like, is there anything that you think we could do with photogrammetry for this Mars project that we might be able to add to our scene or? Yeah, I mean, that's a little bit of a tough one because you think about, okay, even if we got access to, you know, go up to the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena and, you know, get this awesome tour of their office, which like, this sounds great, you know, sign me up. But, um, you know, the fact is like that rover, even if you got to see it in real life, is entirely metal, which makes it really difficult to scan because of the way that light reflects off of it. So it's really hard to mm -hmm. kind of grab a great image of that, um, especially without, you know, if you're just using your iPhone or something, I think, you know, the right equipment, obviously, you know, it's possible. Also, is it really necessary? We have this great 3D model. Um, you know, I think if it was my budget and trying to figure out what to do, that probably wouldn't be what I decided was the best thing to spend the money on because NASA is always going to have a better 3D model uh, than I'm going to be able to create with the resources that I have. Um, so I think it's more thinking about uh, what are other things that we could do? Is there um, you know, are there people there that maybe we could do a volumetric capture of showing how they do their work? Um, you know, if you did get access to, to the lab and tried to do that, um, you know, I know that, uh, something we've talked about is that there are people who have, uh, stitched together existing photos of the Mars landscape and created kind of a photogrammetry version of what Mars looks like, which is pretty cool. That would be a much cooler environment than just the flat plane we've got right now. Right. Or sort of like the imagined versions or an artist's rendering. I mean, I think that could be could be really neat. Um, I think you if you went that route, would have to be really clear with your audience about what that is and what you're showing and you know how those photos came to be. Um, because I think it's a little bit of a misnomer that, oh, this is really Mars, because what you're really doing is taking specific photos and stitching them together into something that's a larger plane, right? Yeah, we can investigate trying to see if we can get enough photos from the, the rover library and see what we can do there. Um, we might be able to actually go to the lab. If we're at the lab, um, yeah, 3D scanning someone's definitely better than a cutout in most cases. Um, is there anything else we might want to try to pick up while we're, if we were at the lab uh, that might like make the existing scene even better and richer? Yeah, or even just an additional scene of some of the tools that they use to measure things, or even a big photogrammetry scan. They have like a test space where they put the rover out. Could you do like a big scale photogrammetry capture of just the test area instead of, you know, trying to stitch together pictures from Mars? Yeah, that might that actually might be really good because obviously I can't go to Mars to photogrammetry the actual environment there, but if they have a, a mock-up of the Martian landscape, uh, we could try to photogrammetry that into an environment. That might work really well. Um, I think, you know, if, if we can send somebody out there, we can send them out with a DSLR and, and they should be able to walk around that whole environment pretty well to do the scan. Um, if we can't, uh, we've been talking to people over there and, and we've talked through people over the phone before how to take photos with their smartphone and send us the photos so that we can make photogrammetry from it. Um, that might be something that's still doable for us. Yeah, and they might also have models, you know, small scale models of, you know, what they have found there or of the rover itself that's not as reflective because it's not a huge, you know, car sized thing um, that you might be able to scan or have them scan for us. Um, you know, maybe some of the measurement tools or some data analysis that we could take and, and think about, not in photogrammetry, but, you know, is there a way to kind of show that a little bit differently or embed that on top? The other thing I was thinking about was mapping and not mapping Mars, but mapping where the research facilities are here and mm. how did how did it get from this lab, um, you know, in Pasadena to Mars? What was its journey on Earth before before it went up? Right. That can make sense. Yeah, maybe we can even show like you know what was the the transport look like to move these things around from where it gets built to where it gets launched. Right. Cool. Uh, let's, uh, let's try to see if we can put some of that stuff together. Yeah, that sounds fun. Now, unfortunately for this training for series, we didn't actually go collect a lot of photos from NASA and render out the models ourselves. 
Instead, what I can point out to you is this 3D model by Peter Lazansky, which is available on Sketchfab Creative Commons, which you can then check out and see how he took uh, many photographs from the Rover's ma uh, master cam and has gone ahead and placed it into photogrammetry software to create a true three-dimensional Martian environment that we could then go ahead and use as the base underneath uh, the 3D scene that we created. Go ahead and check that out. Maybe you go ahead and you swap out the 3D environment. Instead of having the image plane that we're using, you might actually use his photogrammetry model then in your project. Now, your homework for this week is if you have a PC, you should really go ahead and get a chance at downloading uh, Reality Capture and taking yourself a number of photos of an object that you think fits the parameters and rules of photogrammetry, upload those or copy those into your Reality Capture project and render out a model for yourself to see how it works. If you're not working with a PC, there are other softwares out there that you can find uh, by visiting the photogrammetry software Wikipedia page and see what might work on your Mac or other device. There's no need for yourself to pay for this test render. It's really just a goal for you to learn how to take photographs, put them into the software, and see within that software, okay, I got that to work. If you do want to pay and, and go ahead and take back your model and use it in future productions, I absolutely encourage you to do so. Also, of course, you can then use those sample image sets and go ahead and render out some things that way and bring them into Blender and see how they work from there. That's all for this episode. In the next one, we will talk about how you take your XR projects to the next level and what are some more advanced skills or technologies you might employ as you proceed down your XR career. We'll see you then.